Dr. Chris Frey is a professor of environmental engineering at NC State, as well as an adjunct professor in the Division of Environment and Sustainability at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, which I think is very cool. Um, he was a member of the US EPA's uh, Science Advisory Board from 2012 to 2018 and was chair of the EPA's KSAC, that's Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee, um, from 2012 to 2015. He also served on KSAC review panels for all six criteria air pollutants, including ozone, particulate matter, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, and lead, um, and has become a very vocal critic of the changes to EPA science review process, which you'll hear about, um, and over the past several months has been widely quoted of, around examinations of the current administration's air pollution policies. He's also written extensive analyses and helped organize several letters from former members of EPA's advisory, uh, advisory panels commenting on KSAC issues. Um, and so without further ado, Nick, I'm gonna, or Nick, Chris, I'm gonna give you uh, screen share capabilities. I'm gonna stop. Beautiful. Okay, can you see my title slide? Okay, good. Uh, well, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I, I didn't really think of myself as a vocal critic. It's just saying what needs to be said, but um, I guess I am vocal about what I'm saying. So, um, okay, I'm gonna take you on a whirlwind tour of the uh, scientific or non-scientific review of the National Ambient Air Quality Standards or the NACs for particulate matter. And I'm gonna focus particularly on fine particulate matter. Um, the standards actually address coarse particles and non-health effects, but I, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna focus on fine particles and health effects. Okay, let me get the clicker going. Um, so uh, a brief outline is I'm gonna talk about the mandate of the Clean Air Act to review the air quality standards, um, how the standards have been, and in my opinion, should be reviewed. Um, than how the particulate matter NACs actually was reviewed. Um, and then the um, advice of the dismissed PM review panel and uh, the proposed rule came out about a month ago. So I'll talk about the proposal and its flaws and then next steps. So section 108 of the Clean Air Act uh, requires EPA to issue uh, air quality criteria, which is a scientific assessment that uh, air pollutant causes adverse effects and the nature and extent and severity of those adverse effects. That, that the administrator's judgment. Uh, there's some echo, I don't know if it's unmuted. Turn down my speaker volume too, okay. Um, anyway, we'll see if that helps. Um, the standards are set, um, based on the administrator's judgment that the pollution may reasonably be anticipated to endanger public health or welfare. And the word anticipated is extremely important because this does not require an absolute burden of proof. Uh, and the review should accurately reflect the latest scientific knowledge. And these reviews nominally should be done every five years. Uh, under the law, it says every five years. Uh, EPA has not always done it in five years though. Um, Section 109 says that the standards must be requisite to protect the public health with an adequate margin of safety, which the federal courts have interpreted to mean um, that they should provide a reasonable degree of protection, not just for the general public, but also for um, sensitive or highly exposed or susceptible populations, also known as at-risk populations. Uh, Section 109 also requires that the administrator is advised by an independent scientific review committee, um, which is the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee, uh, and that committee is chartered with the U.S. Congress. And among other things, it, sh it shall recommend to the administrator any new standards or revision of existing criteria and standards as may be appropriate. Uh, in terms of the um, NACS review process, so the Clean Air Act says this must be based on science. So we think of it as a science review or science-based process. Uh, in 2006, the EPA staff uh, redesigned the NACS review based on um, getting input from lots of stakeholders. And they created this design 
where I won't try to go through every detail of this diagram, but uh, the EPA staff produced several key documents. Uh, one is an integrated review plan that's the design for the, the review and what the, the ground rules will be for the integrated science assessment and the um, other documents listed here. So the integrated science assessment is what formerly was known as the criteria document. This establishes the scientific criteria, the causality determinations, and what are the hazards that are known to be causally related uh, to exposure to a given pollutant. Um, and also, basically, you could think of it as a large scientific literature review, but also it's a synthesis and evaluation of the literature. It's not just a, a review. Um, a risk and exposure assessment is developed if warranted. Um, in many reviews, uh, there's a need for a, a, a very new risk assessment. Sometimes that's not the case. Like in the last lead review, we just relied on the previous risk assessment from the prior review. But with fine particles, um, EPA actually has done quite a substantially revised risk assessment. But as you'll see, they did not do a risk and exposure assessment as a standalone document. And then the policy assessment is developed by EPA staff to interpret the scientific evidence from both the ISA uh, and the, the REA, the risk and exposure assessment, with regard to the policy and legal requirements for whether a current standard is adequate or if not on revised or new standards. So that represents the staff advice. Each of these documents is reviewed by the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee and in reviewing those documents, uh, the Case Act can discharge its obligation under the Clean Air Act to advise the administrator also on whether existing standards are adequate or if, you know, if not, uh, revisions or new standards. And each of these reviews involves public comment, um, so there's an opportunity for public interaction. So if we look at the review from the perspective of all the documents it generates, um, we would have an initial review plan that's reviewed by CASAC and then a final. Then there's usually two drafts of an integrated science assessment before that goes final. And then on a staggered schedule, there's uh, risk and exposure assessment drafts and final and then policy assessment drafts and final. And so there's a couple of key elements here. One is that there's successive review and improvement of these documents based on external scientific input. And also that the policy assessment doesn't really begin until the science assessment is essentially finished so that you establish the science before getting into the policy. So that's how things have been done. Um, KSAC by law has seven members and it's been recognized that seven members is not enough to provide the range of expertise needed. Um, so, you know, the expertise for particulate matter includes you know, atmospheric sciences, exposure assessment, epidemiology, toxicology, controlled human studies, risk assessment, uncertainty analysis, and, and other areas. And typically, um, there's a desire to have multiple experts in key areas like epidemiology uh, or controlled human studies where, you know, there's significant amount of evidence from those disciplines. And so we need people who have the, the breadth, depth, and diversity of expertise, experience, and perspectives to provide uh, credible advice to the agency. So as a result, for four decades, I won't go through the details here, but this is just to show that for four decades, the seven-member CASAC has been augmented with expert review panels for each criteria pollutant for each review. And on average, these panels are about 15 people on top of this seven members of CASAC. And roughly there's 20 to 25 experts altogether who advise EPA on you know, the scientific basis of a given standard. Okay, so now I'm gonna go through the changes that have been made. So I talked about the way the process has been. Uh, and in my view is, you know, there's some issues with it in terms of timing, but I don't think anyone has ever said it's not a rigorous process. Um, so uh, in 2017, Administrator Pruitt and then followed um, in 2018 by Administrator Wheeler, have implemented a number of changes in the middle of the review for particulate matter. And I characterize these as, as ad hoc changes. So they, you know, th this was not established prior to this review. they are changes made in midstream with typically without advance notice, without involving stakeholders or the CASAC or the public. Um, 
so in 2017, Pruitt issued a memo that changes membership criteria for all EPA advisory committees. And for CASAC and the Science Advisory Board, it puts more emphasis on geographic location, doesn't even acknowledge scientific expertise. It also puts emphasis on government affiliation of members, not scientific expertise. And the most controversial has been that it's banned non-governmental recipients of EPA research grants. This last one is, is being litigated in federal court. Um, there's some recent decisions that have found this is arbitrary and capricious, but I think this will still go through at higher courts, and so I don't think we know the last word on that issue yet. Um, so this is a, just a, a schematic of what the CASAC PM review was like um, just prior to October 10th, 2018. Uh, so we had the 20 member PM review panel that had been appointed in 2015 to augment the chartered CASAC, which has seven members. But in fact, only six of those members were participating in the PM review. Um, and there's some details as to why that is. I, I won't get into that unless you have questions. But um, the main point is that the, the, the small CASAC was augmented by a large group of um, diverse experts. And then uh, Administrator Wheeler on Oc October 10th, 2018, without any advance notice, uh, by press release, just uh, got rid of the um, uh, KSAC Particulate Matter Review Panel. So that left the review with six people, uh, by the way, uh, none of whom is an epidemiologist. Um, so the PM review, as you'll see, is heavily based on epidemiology, and yet Administrator Wheeler has placed the review in the hands of people who really lack epidemiological expertise. So uh, between Pruitt and Wheeler, uh, the two of them replaced all seven members of the chartered KSAC. Um, the, the nature of the members is quite different than the prior KSAC. So KSAC typically has had research scientists. Uh, now it has, it's led by an industry consultant uh, with a lot of uh, folks from state agencies and only one, actually now two research scientists, uh, but, but very little in terms of people on the cutting edge of, of leading research. Um, the, the disbanding of the review panel I've mentioned, and incidentally, I'm not gonna talk about ozone in this talk, but the same thing's going on with the ozone review, that the administrator has refused to form an ozone review panel for the current ozone review. Um, so the uh, public, in, including me, but including many other folks, and even the KSAC itself, um, advised the administrator that uh, deprived of external experts, uh, you know, made this very challenging for KSAC to, to conduct the science review. And so the administrator responded to that by forming, rather than reappointing the disbanded panel, uh, he decided instead to do something different that's never been done before which is form an ad hoc pool of 12 consultants who are not allowed to deliberate with the KSAC. Um, so that hardly substitutes for an interactive panel that you know, deliberates with the members of the chartered KSAC. Um, there's some other issues with that pool in that many of them have apparent conflicts of interest uh, with members of KSAC or with regulated industry. Um, in addition, based on a memorandum written by Scott Pruitt in May of 2018, uh, which Administrator Wheeler has more or less implemented, uh, you know, the, the review uh, for the PM standard and the ozone standard are both being compressed into a very short amount of time, given the scope of what needs to be done, which also eliminates opportunities for public comment. And for example, uh, EPA has refused to provide external reviews of, of uh, second drafts of any of the, the, the documents like the integrated science assessment. Um, EPA has eliminated the planning document for the risk assessment, has eliminated altogether a separate risk and exposure assessment and just combined that into the policy assessment, which has made it quite challenging to review. Uh, even the Chartered KSAC had trouble reviewing this commingled risk and policy assessment. And then I think most egregiously in terms of the documents is timing the policy review at the same time as the science review. And you know that opens the door for potential mischief. 
Um, so this is a, a photograph of one of KSAC's meeting. And the reason I, I show this is that I've been in many KSAC meetings. And usually uh, there's a large number of people at the table. There's usually about 20 to 25 experts between the chartered KSAC and the review panel. Um, here there's six members of the KSAC and one EPA staff person to oversee the meeting. Um, so honestly, in my view, this is a joke. Um, and none of these, you know, folks are leading epidemiologists. Um, and, you know, only one person in this picture is, you know, is a well-recognized leading research scientist. And so this is just so different from any previous case act that I've ever seen. Um, so I was on the um, particle review panel that was dismissed. And, you know, within a few weeks of being dismissed, we, we communicated by email. And we, we kind of all agreed that, well, the way things are going, EPA is not going to get the advice it needs on the PM NACs. And, you know, we're, we're a reasonable good group to provide that advice. So we ought to continue to develop and provide advice, even though we're no longer an official panel. So we, um, we actually reconvened ourselves by email a few times to send in some uh, public comments. Um, but uh, by summer of 2019, we, we kind of realized we need to have a face-to-face -face meeting and really deliberate in depth on uh, the policy assessment and provide advice that we would have provided had we not been dismissed. And so with um, some logistical support from the Union of Concerned Scientists, we were able to reconvene um, coincidentally on the anniversary of our dismissal. Um, at the same hotel where KSAC usually has its meetings in Crystal City. And um, so we deliberated on the EPA charge questions that we would have had to deal with had we not been disbanded. Um, so we, um, I, I don't have time to acknowledge all the members of the panel, but, you know, we have, you know, leading epidemiologists, toxicologists, uh, you know, doctors who do controlled human studies, um, exposure assessors, um, air quality measurement and modeling experts, and so on. So, you know, we have the breadth, depth, and diversity of expertise, experience, and perspectives that are needed for this review that, and that are lacking in the Chartered Case Act. Um, so we followed the same process and procedures as if we had not been disbanded. We were assisted by the former director of the EPA Science Advisory Board Office, um, and we also had access to uh, one of the former members of EPA's Office of General Counsel, as, as well as a former um, uh, assistant director of Air and Policy in the, in the Policy Office at EPA. So, um, you know, we, we had a lot of uh, in-kind resources that helped us do this job. Um, we developed a letter and submitted it officially to the EPA. Um, and among our key findings, I, you know, our first, I think our, one of our important findings was to commend the, the staff. So the EPA staff, for example, in the Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards, which did the policy assessment, had to do this under extenuating, unprecedented, and inappropriate constraints. Um, but we think they did a, a you know, tremendous good faith effort at what they did. Um, we didn't agree with everything that they proposed, but you know, we, we thought they undertook this in good faith and with integrity. Uh, so, you know, we wanted to recognize that. Um, in terms of our findings, um, you know, we found that the current fine particle standards, both annual and 24 hours, are not protective of public health. Um, that EPA could retain the current indicators, averaging times, and forms. And I don't have time to explain what that means, but happy to do that if there are questions. Um, but in terms of the level of the standards, that the annual standard is currently at 12 micrograms per cubic meter, it should be revised downward to between 10 and 8 micrograms, and the current 24-hour standard at 35 should be revised downward to between 30 and 25 micrograms per cubic meter. And these recommendations are based on consistent epidemiologic evidence from multiple multi-city studies augmented, augmented with evidence from single city studies at policy relevant ambient concentrations in areas with actually what we call pseudo design values at and below the levels of the current standards. And this is supported by um, coherent research from experiments with animals and humans um, that contributes to both the causality uh, determination of adverse effect and the biological plausibility of adverse effect. And it's also supported by a limited number of so-called accountability studies. 
Uh, one thing we pointed out is that, you know, EPA should be protecting not just the general public, but at-risk subgroups. And um, the big Harvard Medicaid-based study, the D et al. 2017 study that uh, is one of the major studies to find adverse effects well below the current standard also found that the hazard um, or the relative risk for African Americans is three times higher than that for the overall population. Uh, and this is the kind of information that KSAC should be advising the administrator on. By the way, KSAC did not advise the administrator on this point. Um, so in terms of advice that the administrator received from his, uh, uh, what, what I think I objectively call the cherry picked rigged KSAC, um, is that um, somehow associations uh, between fine particle exposures and mortality in their view can reasonably be explained away uh, because of uncontrolled confounding or other potential sources of error and bias. Now, our panel talked quite a lot about confounding and whether or not confounding was a threat to validity of the epidemiologic studies. But of course, we actually had epidemiologists on our panel. Uh, KSAC doesn't have any. Um, KSAC um, made kind of a big deal about exposure being estimated and not actual. Um, which is kind of, in a, in a way, silly. There, there's no good way to know actual exposures for 60 million people. Um, so, of course, it's estimated. But the question is, you know, whether the estimates are good enough to support the um, uh, statistical analysis of associations with adverse effects. So this is something our panel talked quite a bit about. Um, the Case Act just raised this as a laundry list of qualitative uncertainties, I think, without really understanding what they were talking about. Um, they also, and I was in the room when one of the members said this, they said that the new evidence in this review mainly confirms what was anticipated or already assumed in setting the 2012 NACs. Now, I was also on the PM review panel for the 2012 review cycle. And at that time, the available epidemiologic evidence pointed to significant associations down to about 11 micrograms per cubic meter. In this review, we see significant associations down below eight micrograms per cubic meter. If then we have the now available evidence, I'm confident that then we would have re recommended a standard below uh, you know, the 12 or you know, uh, the range we looked at in the last review. So uh, this second bullet point is just completely illogical and nonsensical in my view. Um, so somehow the case act concluded that there's no new information that calls into question the existing standard. Now there's at least one member who had an opposite view that new evidence does reasonably call into question the adequacy of the 2012 standard. And it's somewhat unusual for case act to be split like that, but the majority of the, of the case act uh, found no need to change the standard. Um, and um, the administrator actually acknowledges that there was some diversity of opinion in KSAC, but not surprisingly, he aligns with the, the KSAC members that found no, no need to change the standard. So I, I think I mentioned this before, but there are no epidemiologists on KSAC. And as you see, epidemiology is a central discipline in this assessment. Um, so in the administrator's, um, uh, well, I should back up. So, so the uh, EPA proposed that to retain the current fine particle standard in the Federal Register Notice on April 30th, uh, just about a month ago. Um, and so the administrator did acknowledge in that um, proposed rule that the requirement to provide an adequate margin of safety is intended to address uncertainties associated with inconclusive scientific evidence and to provide a reasonable degree of protection against hazards that research has not yet identified. And what that means and what the courts think it means and what the courts have said that means is EPA does not have to set a standard based on absolute certainty and the EPA should anticipate um, not, you know, anticipate potential effects, not just look at known effects. Uh, nonetheless, having acknowledged that, the administrator um, argues that um, epidemiologic associations alone without supporting experimental evidence at similar fine particle concentrations leave important questions unanswered. Uh, in my view, the big question unanswered here is, uh, what does the administrator think is the role of experimental studies and how do those studies work? Um, and I think it's well known, and, and many of you know this way better than I do, but 
you know, animal toxicological studies are not going to be conducted at the level of human exposure uh, because if you do that in order to avoid false negatives, you would need such a tremendously large sample size that it would just be infeasible to conduct the study. And I also think that no institutional review board, for example, is going to approve a study of 24 hour exposure at 35 micrograms per cubic meter for severely asthmatic children. Um, so they're just studies that can never be done. Um, and that doesn't prevent KSAC from providing advice and it doesn't prevent the administrator from regulating. Um, the second bullet point, um, there's a lack, this, basically this is a lack of accountability studies. You know, so these are the, the epidemiologic studies that look at an intervention before and after the intervention to see what the effect was. And the administrator is bemoaning that there are no accountability studies at the level of the current standard. Well, that's never been a requirement. Um, and actually, so this, this is sort of an irrelevant point in my opinion. Uh, and, and then the administrator just goes on to hype uncertainty. Uh, and based on that, the administrator proposes to retain the current standard. So there's some omissions from the administrator's rationale. One is there's no mention of at-risk populations. Um, there's no mention of environmental justice. Actually, there's other laws that require EPA to explicitly consider environmental justice in setting a standard like an air quality standard. And there's no explanation of why the administrator acknowledges the um, Clean Air Act's intent to deal with anticipated effects, but why he's arguing that uncertainty means raising the burden of proof rather than anticipating those effects. So in terms of where we are now, um, the, the, the public comment period for uh, this proposed rule is open through June 29th. Um, you can submit comments on regulations.gov. Um, uh, here's the docket ID. Um, if you are submitting comments, uh, just some advice. Um, the real audience for these comments is probably not Administrator Wheeler. I think he's unlikely to change his decision. So I would expect he will finalize a rule to retain the current PM standard, um, which then will go to court. Uh, so the real question, you know, the real audience is the federal courts. And so why would a court listen to your comment? Uh, so in the introduction to your comment, explain your expertise and experience to establish your credibility, and then lay out and support facts that, you know, either the agency has used, if you agree with that, or has ignored, um, in language that judges will understand, uh, support any uh, you know, facts that you're asserting with evidence. Um, and it's not effective to just complain or disagree that there has to be a rationale or a basis for that disagreement with the agency. And also it, you don't feel obliged to cover everything. Uh, you can cover the things that you're most familiar with and that's really more effective than trying to do everything. Um, courts will look at comments that contain specific information um, if you cite studies, which you should if you can, um, those studies are not part of the record unless you submit those to the docket. So uh, the advice I've heard many times is attach the studies separately from your comments, uh, especially if they're copyrighted. And on uh, regulations.gov, you can attach multiple files. So uh, where things go after this is uh, it's very likely there'll be a final rule um, within some months, certainly by the end of the year. And then uh, I have no doubt that EPA will be sued. Um, and so that's really what I had to share. Um, I would like to acknowledge the help I've alluded to earlier. Uh, and also if you wanna get in touch with me, um, you're welcome to send me an email. And if you'd like to see the detailed report from our panel, uh, it's available from this uh, this is the simplest URL of the various places you could find it uh, at, here at UCS. It's also on the EPA docket uh, and some other EPA sites. So with that, um, I turn it back to Swati and happy to answer questions. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Chris. That was a great presentation. Um, I would like to encourage anybody who has any questions to either unmute themselves um, and, uh, oh, what a nice compliment from Phil Brown. Um, so Trish Komen says that you mentioned a lack of epidemiologist expertise on the KSAC um, and that EPA has had a lot of budget and staff loss. So to what extent does the EPA have the epidemiology expertise that it needs, in your opinion? Yeah, it's a great question and there's a lot of issues there to unpack. But the, the short answer is uh, EPA has, you know, very good epidemiologists. 
uh, both in the Office of Research and Development that prepares the integrated science assessment and the Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards that prepares the policy assessment. So they're not lacking for epidemiologic expertise. So actually the staff, you know, as I said earlier, the staff I think are to be commended. And I really want to, if I didn't make that clear, want to clearly separate my criticisms of the administrator uh, from, you know, my, uh, you know, praise for the staff. Um, so uh, actually, uh, it, it, during many KSAC meetings, uh, you know, I kind of sat in the room mumbling to myself, you know, why doesn't the chair of KSAC ask one of EPA's epidemiologists to address an epidemiologic issue that KSAC was bouncing back and forth in, 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 a, in a knowledge vacuum? You know, I heard many times in KSAC meetings, for example, the chair and others saying, oh, well, these studies didn't con con account for confounding from daily maximum temperature. And, you know, first of all, that makes no sense for annual studies. And it's not as if temperature hasn't been looked at in daily studies. And if they would have just asked an EPA staff person, that person could have provided input, even though KSAC lacked epidemiologists itself. So anyway, yeah, it's not an issue there of, of, of lack of EPA staff. I mean, there's some bigger issues at the agency with uh, loss of staff, but, but that doesn't directly impinge on what the staff did in this instance. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Um, does anybody else have any questions? I see a few people have unmuted themselves. Uh, Duncan or? Uh, okay, so this is Duncan Thomas. Uh, I was uh, just typing in my comment, but I will uh, say it instead. I was one of that pool. Yes, of, I know. Uh, and I, 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 I hope I wasn't too short with that because there were some really excellent members of the ad hoc consultant panel. And I, I really enjoyed all of your comments. I think you were spot on. Um, and I really wish your comments would have gotten more attention from the KSAC. Well, the issue I wanted to raise with you is um, the, the chair's disparagement of most of epidemiology is demonstrating association, not causation. And advocating uh, in a series of his earlier papers um, a rather strange view of causality. And I wonder whether you uh, wanted to elaborate at all on your thoughts about his uh, approach to causality. Oh, uh, sure. I, I, you know, I, you may know this material much better than I do. You know, I'm I'm an environmental engineer, so I'm not an epidemiologist, and I'm always quick to point that out. But uh, so my perspective on um, so the chair of KSAC is Tony Cox, and um, he has for some years been. Uh, you know, writing uh, in some journals and also testifying to Congress and, you know, he wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal in 2015, you know, about how a revised ozone standard would ruin the U.S. economy. Um, but a lot of his arguments are based on um, his assertion that um, there's no proof that um, a reduction or an intervention in lowering air pollution, whether it's particulate matter or ozone, actually has resulted in a reduction in adverse effects. And so he takes a very narrow view, um, you know, that each individual study should demonstrate cause and effect. And um, he proposes a number of quantitative causality tests that should be applied to individual epidemiologic studies. And so one by one, if those studies fail to, you know, pass the threshold that he's imposing of inferring causality, then uh, and he actually wrote this in one of his comments, each of those studies individually, one at a time, should be thrown out. And then, um, you, you know, when you're done, you wouldn't have any studies left over. Um, and uh, that's a very novel point of view. Um, the, the traditional point of view on KSAC has been to do a weight of evidence assessment of all of the studies, recognizing that each study has strengths and limitations and, uh, you know, a defect in one study might be accounted for in another and vice versa, and they all have something to contribute. Um, but also, I think there, there's been, um, there, there's a nice commentary by uh, Corey Ziegler and Francesca Dominici in 2017 um, that argues that, you know, some of the earlier studies, like they specifically point out the Harvard Six City studies, they said that study did not use causal language in interpreting uh, their results, but it actually did account, it, it did account for causality in some ways. Um, and so I think there's an underappreciation or uh, underinterpretation 
of the causal implications of, of some past studies combined with this kind of um, very narrow, uh, you know, honestly non-mainstream perspective from the chair of KSAC. Uh, and there've been more recent commentaries about, um, you know, Dr. Cox's um, proposals for you know, quantitative causality tests on individual studies that, you know, maybe there's some good ideas there and it's something that should be looked at, um, but it's just not ready for prime time. And, you know, we don't change the scientific inference methods in the middle of a review to accommodate even the most strongly expressed preference of the most vocal critic. Um, you know, there, there are pretty well established, you know, with some limitation methodologies that, that pre-exist um, that have seemed to work well. Um, so, you know, that's probably a longer answer than you would like me to give, but um, yeah, that's kind of the gist of it is, is imposing a one at a time per study criteria uh, that has the intended effect, as Tony says, of throwing each study out and then you pretend you don't know anything. I think that's, that's how I interpret what he's proposing. Well, thank you. Um, I wanna give other people a chance to ask questions, but uh, let me just highlight one thing that you said uh, referring to the previously used weight of evidence approach, which also came under uh, quite some criticism from the new KSAC. And I wonder if you wanted to elaborate on that as well. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there are limitations to the, uh, you know, for those of you who are maybe not that familiar with, with the weight of evidence approach, um, you know, I, if you've heard of Sir Bradford Hill, uh, and his, his, what he calls his aspects uh, from his 1965 lecture. You know, he posits several, you know, criteria or aspects or that you would go through to say, well, if, if the studies have this characteristic, we would be more confident that there's a causal relation. And ultimately it is a judgment-based approach. I mean, it requires expert judgment of a multidisciplinary group of experts. And, you know, actually this is exactly why KSAC should be augmented with an external review panel that has that expertise. Um, in terms of criticisms of that, I think there are some, you know, ways that that methodology potentially can fail, um, but I think that's understood and, you know, people are, are thoughtful about potential threats to validity of causal inferences. Um, I, I think, interestingly, uh, Dr. Cox, I've heard him because I've sat in many KSAC meetings. On the one hand, he will um, and has argued strongly that expert judgment is highly flawed. And he points to, you know, classic findings in the cognitive psychological literature about overconfidence and estimation of uncertainty and so on, which is true. Um, he never points out that, well, as a result of that, you know, people have figured out how to elicit those judgments to mitigate against overconfidence, maybe not perfectly, but, but that's a known issue where there's some remedies for that. So the remedies don't get mentioned at all. He just leaves that hanging. Um, and then um, it just it kind of illogically, he, he does away with expert judgment as being credible. Um, and then uh, seems to assume that this small group of six people who lack expertise in key disciplines nonetheless is the authority to opine on you know, issues uh, far and wide ranging outside their own expertise. So I, I think it's quite a, a conundrum that, that they put themselves in. But I've actually, some of my public comments, I focus in specifically on these expert judgment issues that he's raised and some of the inconsistencies and some of the biases that go beyond cognitive biases that deal with motivational biases that I think undermine this case act. Excellent. Uh, thanks so much, Chris. Uh, Mary, did you have a question? I see you on your video yourself. There you go. I just wanted to ask about, um, well, our current crisis has to do with a respiratory disease that also seems to affect the ability of the, the body to deal with blood clots and strokes and cardiovascular disease. Is anybody thinking about the effect of air pollution on what we're dealing with right now. Yes, definitely. Um, I will say again, I'm not the expert on that, but um, you know, for example, the the basically the same group at Harvard that did the you know 60 million plus Medicare study um, that I cited in my talk. Um, very recently, they've released prior to peer review a preliminary assessment of 
uh, an epidemiologic inference about the relationship between fine particles, COVID-19, and adverse outcomes. And, you know, they seem to have found some association, but uh, I, I think a challenge in the public debate is because they have not had that study peer reviewed. Uh, you know, for example, Administrator Wheeler has kind of dismissed it as, well, it hasn't been peer reviewed, um, which is true, it, it hasn't been peer reviewed. Um, there are some other studies that um, have been peer reviewed um, that seem to find some association between um, nitrogen dioxide exposures and COVID-19 and adverse outcomes. Um, and I think there's a few more of those. It seems like they're starting to come out, you know, maybe not daily, but uh, I think there are a lot of people in that space trying to get studies out. Um, I'm personally, I, I kind of am a little bit cautious about those studies. I, I think I'd like to wait and see a bit. Um, and again, I'm not, I'm not a medical expert. I'm not a toxicologist. I'm not an epidemiologist. So I'm probably not the right person to say a whole lot more about that. But the short answer is yes, people are looking at that. Great. And I, I want to say thank you, too, for all the work that you and the former KSAC have done on this issue. It is so important. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks so much, Mary. Um, I, we are running low on time, so I will let uh, Edward ask a quick question. Um, so I have a question for you, Chris. Thank you for an interesting talk. Uh, in the, I was part of the previous expert panel in the last cycle of uh, PM review, as Chris knows. But the, you know, the question came up at that point, and I think was also debated at this point. There was some pushback about the, not only the economic, which of course is not supposed to be part of the issue, but other derived health effects because of the impact of lower, lowering the, the, uh, the federal level uh, for acceptable exposures in terms of quality of life, uh, uh, shelter, uh, work, jobs, sort of, sort of the larger sort of holistic perspective on health. And I wonder if you could comment on uh, to what extent either uh, the current case act has configured weighed in on that, pushed back about that, or emphasize that in their deliberations? Yeah, I think I have two answers to that, and I'll try to be brief. So one answer is, uh, I, actually surprisingly, I thought this administration would really hammer on that issue. Um, you know, this is an issue of looking at sort of the secondary impacts of a, of a standard on the, uh, not so much on the cost of implementation, but whether say implementing a fine particle standard would have like risk risk trade-offs of some kind. Um, you know, if it would, if it would uh, you know, I guess put people out of work and therefore they didn't have health care. you know, those kinds of arguments. And you know, actually surprisingly, this administration as best I can tell has done absolutely nothing with that. Um, at least not in the context of the NACS review. Um, I mean, there's nothing. I mean, KSAC didn't touch that issue. Um, the administrator doesn't seem to touch it in, in the proposed rule, or I haven't seen it yet. Um, but the other thing I would answer is that the EPA is looking, uh, for example, at changing the ground rules for benefit cost assessment, which would apply broadly across many rules. And so it's not exactly this issue, Ed, that you're raising, but what they are trying to do is narrow the scope of the benefits assessment um, so, for example, for the mercury air toxic standard, um, you know, they said, well, the targeted pollutant there is mercury. Um, yes, there are co-benefits if you get reduction in coal power plants, but that wasn't the intended pollutant, so those shouldn't be counted. Um, and so they're trying to undercount the benefits uh, and scope them out. And um, so that may have some traction. So that may be more of a, a long-term effect than you know, the issue you raise in the context of the NACs. Excellent, thank you. All right, I wanna say um, thank you, Chris, for this excellent presentation and to everybody for participating. As you can see, this is a really important issue. It touches on, for sure, some science issues, but also just the structural issues going on with at the agency and how this is gonna have a potentially